of believers. So, you have been looking at the theme of shift and um, I was listening to the past two, yeah, the past two messages that have come before mine today um, and I have the privilege today of speaking on the topic of posture. And I love the fact that in this sequence of P's, so to speak, that posture comes before purpose because a lot of people go from pain and skip, jump right over it and launch into purpose. And that's why we see so many ministries crumbling, so many scandals happening because people overlook that integral part which is tending to one's posture. Tending to your posture in the right season and in every season, to be honest, is what will keep you and sustain you, not only in your personal walk with God, but in the calling of God that's upon your life. So I'm really excited to be delving into this today. If you have your Bibles, can you turn with me to Luke chapter 1? Luke chapter 1, I'm going to be reading from verse 26 to 38. Is everyone there? You need a second? I'm going to be reading from the ESV version, and it's the birth of Jesus foretold. It says, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose, na whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favoured one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Hallelujah. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, this is our key verse, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. My title, if you want to take notes for today, is Postured for the Impossible. Postured for the Impossible. Heavenly Father, we just honor you in this place, Lord God. We thank you for your glory. We thank you for your spirit, O oh God, that has already been so tangible in this building and in this place, Father. And we just pray, Lord God, that you would speak a fresh word to us in this moment. God, we pray that every heart, every soul that is under the sound of my voice, Lord God, would have an open heart, ready to receive a touch from heaven, ready to receive a personal word, Lord God, for their circumstance, for their situation, for their current questions, Lord. And as for me, Father God, I pray that you would use me as your mighty vessel, Lord. Let this be all of you, Lord God, and none of me. Let every word that comes forth from my mouth, Lord God, be drenched in anointing. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Amen. So, like I said, my title is Postured for the Impossible. And I've read this story so many times. It's a story that a lot of us know, even when we weren't Christians, when we weren't saved, we've seen um, the angel Gabriel appearing to Mary and telling her that she would be the chosen mother of the Messiah as he comes on the earth. Mary was an ordinary girl living her life. I think theologians say she was a teenager, about 12, 13. But yet, when the angel Gabriel visits her, he lets her know that though she is an ordinary girl, there is an extraordinary calling that's upon her life. 
the angel Gabriel comes and he visits her with a message, a message that would not only change her life as an individual, as a teenage girl living in Galilee, but a message and a declaration that would change the trajectory of eternity. It wasn't just a moment in history or something that would be natural on the earth that the Messiah would come through a woman, but it was something spiritual. It was something so much bigger than probably what Mary could have even understood in the moment. And from Luke's account of Mary's interaction with the angel Gabriel, I believe we learn so many lessons about posture. We see what it looks like to submit to the purpose of God when you've been inconvenienced. Mary was betrothed, which in those days was a legal binding engagement to be married to Joseph. And now the angel Gabriel is telling her that she's now going to be overshadowed by the power of the Most High. The Holy Spirit is going to overtake her and she would now have a baby. The possibility of being ridiculed, of being outcast, of being shamed, of the fact that Joseph was not the father of that baby. She was getting prepared to be inconvenienced for something that was naturally impossible. Posture defined is a conscious mental or outward behavioral attitude. It can also be defined as a particular approach or attitude. So when we think about posture, it's not necessarily something that you could just look at somebody and immediately see it. Yes, we can see it from the fruit and the actions and the behavior and the speech of that person, but posture is first something that is internal. It's something that takes place in the heart of man, something that really only God can know the fullness of a man's posture. But it's something that is absolutely integral to your walk with God and something that is absolutely integral to how he will use you. There are plenty of people that can be used by God. God can use anything and anybody. But there are certain jobs, certain tasks, certain things that God looks for those who have the right posture. When we think about our purpose and shifting and moving into something bigger, it's so easy to get overwhelmed by the activity. I don't know about you, but I remember when I first came to Christ, there was so much talk about purpose. Everyone's always talking about what God has called you to do, but no one really talks about who are you doing this for. Everyone is saying you need to find out your calling. You need to know your spiritual gifts. You need to make sure that you are, you know, making sure that you're increasing in this thing, making sure you're training up in that thing. But I don't feel like there's enough lessons on how do you stay pure in that thing? How do you stay undefiled in that thing? How do you stay humble in that thing? How do you deal with being gifted and knowing what God has deposited on the inside of you and yet still be pleasing in his sight. Not looking humble onto men and in front of God, you're full of pride and ego and arrogance. But how do we truly know what God has given us and still walk in that thing with the right posture? I've got three things that I believe we learn from Mary's encounter with the angel Gabriel. And it might be a different message from what you were expecting especially from me if you've heard my preaching before I don't really preach like this but praise the Lord um, God gave me a more encouraging and I guess message that would <laughs> guys a message that I believe is really going to stir up faith and courage um, and it's stuff that God has been teaching me in my own personal walk as well which I think will bless you somebody say amen the first thing that I realized whilst I was studying is that Mary is visited by the angel and he says to her, greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. And then it says that Mary is greatly troubled at this saying. And it says that she's trying to discern what sort of greeting this could be. And I said to God, why was Mary troubled at this saying? If we heard this in a prophetic word or an angel appeared unto us, would we not be rejoicing? 
I'm favored of the Lord. The Lord is with me. So why was Mary greatly troubled? My first point for you today is that those who are favored have no reason to be fearful. Those who are favored have no reason to be fearful. It's so easy to live from a posture of fear. It's easy to be doing the outward activities and looking confident and appearing bold, but yet still be operating from a place of fear. I did that for many years, even as God was using me in my teenage years. I would come up and I would preach or I would pray or I would prophesy, but yet I was still so ensnared to what is man going to think of me? Or if I try and do this, what are people going to say? Or I was fearful of my own inadequacy showing up. Or I was scared of the fact that my family would react a certain way. I was looking effective and fruitful on the outside, but yet I was operating from a place of fear. Your posture drives your decisions. Where your heart is in that moment, in relation to what God has asked you to do will be the difference between you stepping out or you staying where you are. It will be the difference between you following God's call to pray for that person or to go to that conference or to post that blog or to start that business. Your posture is where all of that happens. Something that I really relate to with Mary here when she's afraid of the angel's greeting is recognizing that sometimes we can be scared of being favored. We can be scared of being favored. Because when you realize that favor isn't about having tens and thousands of pounds dropping in your bank account, or it's not about having 24 lavish cars, or it's not about having the dream husband and the four kids and the amazing mansion. When you realize that favor from the Lord comes with a level of responsibility upon your life, there's a level of shift that has to come to your time, a level of shift that has to come into your perspectives when you're favored of the Lord, that can be scary. When you understand the favor of the Lord, the fact that when he set his hand upon you, when he set you apart for a time as this, that's scary. Psalm 103 verse 2 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And the rest of that chapter goes on to list all of the great benefits that come to those whom God gives them to. The fact that we've been healed from sickness and disease. The fact that we've been crowned with tender mercies. The fact that we've been forgiven of all our iniquities. All of these benefits can scare us. Psalm 84 verse 11 says, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly before him. Favored doesn't mean perfect. Saying that you're favored or that God has favored you doesn't mean that you're going to live a life without trial. It doesn't mean that you're going to live a life where nothing will ever be hard for you and all things will be of ease. But when you're favored and honored by the Lord, there's a knowing, there's a conviction in your spirit that no good thing will he withhold from me. That everything I need, every resource, every connection, every bit of anointing that I need for the time that he has called me to, to the people that he has called me to, will be given to me. That's favor. He looks upon you and says, you're the one for the job. Living a life of favor looks like knowing that no matter what, this earthly life gives to you. The hand of your heavenly father is on you. So even if people don't choose you for that job, you don't fret about it. I'm favored. When the right door that my heavenly father has for me opens, it's a door that no man can shut. When something doesn't come through the way that you anticipated or expected it, you don't fret. I'm favored. Something better is going to show up so that God gets the glory from this. Some of us are saying we serve a great God, but we're not expecting great things. 
You cannot serve a great God and not expect great things. If you're going to say that you're favored, believe it. If God has said that you're favored, believe it. The next thing I noticed was that Mary was scared of the angel saying, the Lord is with you. Why would you be scared of that, Mary? Why would you be troubled at the fact that the Lord is with you? And God showed me, Caitlin, sometimes my presence scares people because they know the possibilities of it with God. When you know the possibilities of what can happen when God is with you, it shakes every part of your flesh that's ever been complacent. Every part of you that's wanted to stay hidden. Every part of you that has wanted to do just enough but not too much so you look mad. Every part of you starts to shake because you're thinking, if God is with me and I'm reading all of these things that he's done for the people in the Old Testament, how much more now under the new covenant of Christ with his Holy Spirit on the inside of me is he going to try and do with me? How much more is he going to do with me now with the Holy Ghost working on the inside of me? The possibilities of God scare us. Mary's humanity comes out at this moment. She's trying to discern the situation, but simultaneously she's also trying to discern, why me? Why, is, why am I favored? Why is the Lord with me? Some of you have been so used to doing life alone, getting it all done by yourself, feeling lonely in many moments and seasons of your life, but God is saying today, I am with you. I'm not going to give you an assignment and then leave you stranded without strategy or wisdom or my presence to comfort you. If I've commissioned you to do it, if I've sent my angel to declare a thing, don't think that I'm not going to be there every moment. I'm going to be there to give you the details. I'm going to be there to make sure you have the finances for that thing. I will be there. Psalm 23 verse 4 says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. In Deuteronomy 31 verse 8, when Joshua is taken over from Moses to possess the land that God had sworn to their fathers, it says, it is the Lord God who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave nor forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. In every single significant moment or commission in the Bible, the one thing that is definitely promised is God's presence. Before Jesus sends out his disciples, what's the last thing he says in Matthew 28? One of the last things. And I am with you even until the end of the age. When God was commissioning his prophets, his kings, people in the Old Testament, he reminded them that he was with them. God reminded the Israelites that he was with them. Because when nothing else makes sense, the one thing that can keep you sane is knowing that God has not left me, that God has not forsaken me. Even though this whole situation looks like a hot mess, I can know that he is with me. Even when this task, even when this assignment looks so much bigger than me, I can know that I'm not alone. We've settled for normal. We've settled for acceptable. Not realizing that when we go in the power of his presence, he does the exceedingly. He does the abundantly above all we could ever ask or think. We've crafted out our calling according to the logic of what we think is okay of what we think would be impressive or what we think people would find helpful. But God is saying today to some of you, scrap that. Scrap your plan. Scrap what you think your calling should look like. Don't be scared of me being with you in the midst of you trying to figure it all out. Yield to the possibilities of God. Yield to the possibilities of God. Whether it was overtaking a land in the Old Testament, or building the church in the new, his presence was always promised. So if you have a moment this week or this month or this year or in the next five years where you're trying to put your hands to do what God has called you to do and you're having countless doubts and you can't remember a single promise in the Bible, just remember, I am with you. And that's all you could ever need. To know that he is with you is more than enough. The angel's encouragement to Mary as she was being 
afraid of the fact that she was favored and called and commissioned by God to do this thing was do not be afraid Mary for you have found favor with God because God's hand was on her she had no reason to fear when you go in your own strength when you go according to your own timing when you go under the pressure of your family or an expectation of a system then you will be fearful there will be those doubts there will be those continual thoughts in your mind that are thinking am i really called to do this but when you know that you're going by the spirit of the living god it's not to say the doubts won't come it's not to say the fears won't come but there will be a peace on the inside of you to know that because he has set me apart because his hand is upon me i have no reason to fear Though man may reject me, though people may push me to the side or underestimate me, it doesn't matter for he has favored me. So my encouragement to you with that first point is do not be afraid. You are favored of the Lord in your own unique way. The graces and gifts that are upon your life are for the advancement of the gospel, the advancement of the kingdom of God. And none of those things will go to waste in the name of Jesus. You will not die and there will be a whole ministry on the inside of you. You will not die and there will be a whole business on the inside of you. There are things that God is asking you to do and he's saying because you are favored, you have no reason to be fearful. You have no reason to be fearful. You are not average. You are not mediocre. The God of all of heaven and earth is on your side. You have no reason to be fearful. The second thing that we see is that the angel Gabriel goes on to explain what's going to happen to Mary, the fact that she'll give birth to a son. And then it says that Mary asks to the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? How will this be since I am a virgin? I wanted to bust a myth about posture. Faith and questions can coexist. Faith and questions can coexist. For so long we've been taught that if you ask God questions, you don't have faith. We've been taught that if you have inquiries or you're a bit curious about how something might happen or what you need to be doing along the way, it means that you're living in unbelief. But I believe that what God is saying to some of you in here is that in order to actually have the right posture, you need to be willing to have a dialogue with me. Some people don't have the right posture because they just hear one thing from God and they never speak to him again. They just go ahead and then they rush ahead and they're not even thinking about God. How do you want this done? In what way will this happen? Is there anything that's going to change along the way? Is there anything I need to be aware of, Lord God? God is saying to some of you, don't, don't shy away from that dialogue. Maybe some of you have come from churches or systems or places where they said, don't question God. When he speaks, you don't question it. <laughs> Praise the Lord. That's for somebody there. <laughs> but I'm telling you, Mary asked that question and guess what? She got that answer. Some of you are not getting the answers that you want, not because God is stingy, not because the Lord doesn't want to speak, but because you've shut yourself off from the dialogue. God has spoken something to you and you said, okay, that's it. I'll just wait until he says something else again. But in order to have the right posture, you need to be willing to seek him. You need to be willing to ask the foolish questions. You need to be willing to look dumb at the throne of God. How will this be? How will this be, Mary says. Mary recognizes the complexities of what the angel Gabriel has just said to her. She's here trying to listen and going through her mind is the physical barrier, the natural barrier. Maybe for you it's a financial barrier, a familiar barrier. It's a system barrier, a societal barrier, a mental barrier. 
God has told you that you're going to carry something. God has told you that he's commissioned you to do something in this season. And your how will this be is overtaking all things. But guess what God's response is? God's response through the angel Gabriel, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will do it. And I love that with God because whenever people in the Bible ask him, how will this happen? Or what should I say? Or are you sure I'm the one? He never tends to them. He never really goes back and says, well, because you have 20 years of ministry experience, it will be okay. Or because you come from a generation of preachers, you, you'll definitely be fine. But he always says, I will put the words in your mouth or the Holy Spirit will overtake you. It always goes back to him. And yet some of us sit there in our prayer closets and go back and forth about the barriers. I'm to this, I'm to that, I'm not that enough. But God is saying, it's the Holy Spirit. You can go back and forth for months and years and you'll never do what God's called you to do if you don't recognize that at one point you've got to say, God, I can't do this. If it was up to me, I'd probably ruin it. But with your Holy Spirit, I can do all things. The ministry of the Holy Spirit. Something that you should never walk into purpose without. Some of us skip from pain. We say, in my own strength, with my own ideas, with my own understanding, and now I'm going over to purpose. But that key part here for Mary, when she had that question for God, was the Holy Spirit will overtake you. We need to hear from him. We need to be taught by him. We need to be filled by him. Nothing significant in the eyes of God in all the earth was ever done without the spirit of God. From Genesis 1-2, the spirit of God was hovering over the waters in creation. To the resurrection of Christ in Romans 8-11 where it says the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in us. To Acts 4.31 where they were filled with the spirit and they were praying and started to proclaim the word of God with boldness. If all of these big things, creation, the resurrection of Christ, the establishment of the church were happening with the ministry of the Holy Spirit, what makes you think you can do your ministry without him? Without immersing yourself in him, consulting him, being led by him, being guided by him. I would even go as far to say your ministry is not ministry without the Holy Spirit. It's just activity. It might be great for a moment. People might appreciate it on the surface, but there will be no lasting kingdom change without the Spirit of God. As I was studying this, and God was showing me that his response to Mary was the Holy Spirit will do it. The power of the Most High will overtake you. I felt for somebody in here that there was, there's been a life that you've lived where you've done it all. You've always been the one to step in. You've always been the one to take charge. You've always been the one to make it happen in your family, in your friendship groups, in the organizations you've been in. But God has a word for somebody. It might not be for all of you, but for someone in here, God is saying, watch me be your helper in this season. Watch me help you. Watch me uphold you. Watch me sustain you. Don't push away my help any longer. Because the difference between what you can do by yourself versus what you can do with the help of the ever-present Holy Ghost is completely different. So God is saying to somebody in here, drop your guard and let me help you. Let me give you the answer. Let me give you the ideas. Let me strengthen your body. Let me help you. Something that I noticed, though, with this point about faith and questions being able to coexist when we're postured correctly before the Lord, is that if you go back to the birth of John the Baptist foretold, 
Zachariah asks the same question. Zachariah also asks, how shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. And then I laugh because he got a completely different situation with the angel Gabriel. He got silenced. So I was like, Lord, how are they asking the same question? But one of them got shut down and silenced until his son was born. And then another one got the answer. And there's nothing in here that shows the difference between them. So I said to the Lord, what was the difference? And the difference was posture. One was being asked out of unbelief. Another was being asked out of all filled faith. It was something that we couldn't see. It was an invisible difference. It was a posture. They both asked the same question. But through the angel Gabriel, he must have seen one of you is asking because you're thinking, this ain't happening. Another of you is asking because you're saying, wow, how can this be? But I was perplexed because I was saying, Lord, it's crazy how we can be asking similar questions. We can be looking like we're doing the right thing on the surface, but on the inside, we're really filled with unbelief and doubt. The soil of their heart was different. It didn't mean Mary didn't have questions. But even from the later verses that we will look at, we see that Mary had faith. Mary believed that what God said concerning her was going to come to pass. Zachariah was asking from a place of unbelief. Mary was asking her question from a place of faith. So it's okay if you have questions. Questions don't completely take out your faith they don't dilute your faith but you need to have those questions that come from a heart that says God I have questions but I believe that even if I don't understand the answer to your question you're still going to perform your word you're still going to make it happen because you have spoken it I believe it God then goes on through the angel Gabriel to tell him about, to tell her about her relative Elizabeth. Elizabeth was also, was barren, sorry, Mary wasn't barren, she was young. Elizabeth was older and she was barren. And Mary heard the testimony of God for Elizabeth's life when she was about to experience a testimony of her own. And it's so powerful how in the midst of Mary's questions, the angel Gabriel speaks to her about Elizabeth. He encourages her and says, look what the Lord has done. And he gives her a word to hold on to. For nothing is impossible with God. God in his faithfulness gave Mary a word to cling to. Have you ever been in one of those seasons where you just don't want to study? You just don't want to read? You have no energy or capacity to even seek the Lord but there's that one word that he's given you that you know will keep you sometimes it doesn't need to be a whole exegetical lesson it doesn't need to be a whole 45 minute sermon sometimes it can just be six words but nothing is impossible with God being able to hold on to that thing when all the other voices in your head are shouting that you're failing, is shouting that you're not doing enough or that that person is better than you or your testimony is never going to come or you're not going to ever have impact for the name of Christ. When all of those lies come in, you have to hold to that word. Nothing will be impossible with God. When it, the angel Gabriel told Mary of Elizabeth's testimony and what had happened to her Mary didn't go and say okay like wow that's all happening for her what about me the angel Gabriel wasn't telling Mary about Elizabeth's pregnancy to make her feel some type of way he wasn't flaunting it in front of her to make her feel like God's already done something for her already you're just the second person and I came to encourage somebody to say, you don't need to be jealous of another person's blessing. You don't need to be jealous 
of what that sister is doing or what that brother is building. God has given you sight of it so you can recognize what he can do with you. If God has put you in that environment where you're seeing people flourish in their calling, you're seeing people around you walk in the gifts of God and steward their portion well, it's not so that he can shove it in your face and make you feel bad about yourself. He's saying, watch what I'm doing because you're next. Watch what I'm doing because you're next. God's not trying to make you feel bad. And I feel like that's a word for someone in here. You're listening to testimonies week after week thinking, is God just trying to shove it in my face that nothing's happening for me? But God is saying, I'm giving you sight of those things so your faith can be increased. So that you can recognize that because I've done it for them, trust me, I can do even more than for you. Mary didn't have time to get jealous. She was postured correctly. She was focused on what God was saying that she would be carrying. And the funny thing is that she would be carrying someone more mighty, greater than John the Baptist. Some of us are here getting jealous over things that are even smaller than what God is calling you to. God is calling you for something bigger, something greater, something that will literally change the trajectory of eternity, but you're focused on somebody else's small thing. And it's not to say that the small thing doesn't matter because we need small things for big things to happen. But some of you are looking at other people doing what they're doing and thinking, why can't I even have that? But God is saying, why do you want John the Baptist when you can have Jesus? Why do you want something small when you can have the great? Mary didn't have time to be jealous. She heard the word of the Lord. She heard that she would be carrying the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who would redeem Israel. She didn't have time to be getting catty with Elizabeth about what she was carrying. I'll close that point by reminding you that being faith-filled doesn't mean that you don't have questions. Bring your questions to him. God is saying, bring your questions to the throne room. Every question you have about the purpose and the calling of God upon your life, bring it on to me. And the final thing that God showed me about posture in this text comes from Mary's response in verse 38. She says, Mary said, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. The third lesson we learn about posture is that the posture of servanthood is paramount. Paramount means of first priority. It means of the highest importance. The posture of servanthood is paramount. We are so used to running our own lives, running the show, having everything go by what we think should be done in a moment according to our own plans and logic and desires. But I believe that what Mary exemplified here was true discipleship. Was laying down the fact that, you know, she might have had a bridal shower to plan and a wedding to plan and all these things she would have been planning because she's engaged, she's trying to move on with her life as a small girl in Galilee. But Mary shows us what it means to be yielded. What it means to give yourself over to someone or something else, to have a desire for your life and yet say yes to someone who is greater, to recognize that when the master speaks, there's no other option but yes. Servant in the Greek is doule, the, verse, the word that is used here. And it literally means a female slave subject to one who worships and submits to God. So Mary's use of that word servant is so key here. She didn't just say, yeah, I'll do what the Lord wants me to do then. She identified herself as a servant. We see that with Paul in the New Testament as well. He says, I'm a bond servant of Christ. When you're a servant, when you are submitted underneath somebody, there's no room for, oh, okay, well, I want to do it my own way or I don't really feel like doing what you've told me today. 
You're a servant. Being a servant requires humility. And when we're thinking about servanthood, we need to think about humility and submission being the posture of our hearts. At his beck and at his call, you answer and you obey. James 4 verse 6 says, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And Proverbs 29 verse 23 says, One's pride will bring him low, but he who is lowly in spirit will obtain honor. Some of us answer to the beck and the call of people's expectations. Some of us answer to the beck and the call of our fears and insecurities. But God is saying in this time and this day, I need people that will answer to the beck and call of my voice. That when I speak, you will be like Samuel in 1 Samuel 3, who says, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Your servant is listening. That means I'm not just listening to see if what you say aligns with my five-year plan. I'm listening because I am a servant. So no matter what it is that you say that I have to listen to, I'm going to follow through with it. Because you can listen and not be a servant. And you can also be a servant and not be listening. The next thing that I see Mary does is she qualifies who she's a servant of. She doesn't say, I'm a servant, full stop. She says, I'm a servant of the Lord, of the Lord. Posture isn't just about the fact that you're a servant, but it's about whose servant you are. Some of you have been servants to fear, servants to society, servants to culture, servants to expectations, servants to fears and anxieties, servants to so many other things but the Lord. And we don't realize it until we get to these moments in our walk where we're like, have I even been doing what God has been asking me to do? Or am I just going based off of what other people want me to do? What other people expect me to do? What even I expect myself to do? Am I even doing what God wants me to do? Mary says she's a servant of the Lord. In this season, God is drawing you back to being his servant. All those other things that have kept you captive, all those other things that you've been in bondage to, you've been following the voice of so many other people and things, God is saying, no, you're my servant. You're my servant. And then Mary says, let it be to me according to your word. Let it be to me according to your word. This is something that has always, always stuck out to me about Mary. When she says this, let it be to me according to your word. Mary came into agreement with the declaration of God. Mary came into agreement with the declaration of God. You can hear so many prophetic words. You can have thousands of people speak over your life in the midst of your journey with Christ. But if you don't ever come into agreement with that thing and say to the Lord, let it be unto me according to your word, you will never see that thing manifested properly in your life. There's a level of agreement that is necessary for you to see what God is promising you. We must stand in agreement with what God speaks and what God reveals. We see power and true transformation when we partner with God. When we read this word, when we hear his voice and we say, yes, Lord, even though it doesn't make sense to me, I'm going to stand in agreement. Because of who spoke it, I'm going to trust it. Because of who said he's going to perform it, I'm going to trust it. Some of you are like, God, God has given me this analogy where, you know when you're younger, I don't know if it was just my parents, but they made sure that if strangers were offering me sweets or just things just randomly, they say, don't take it, you, you don't know what, what is in that or what they could be doing. 
So I, I remember always being cautious that if people were just offering me stuff randomly, I would, I would just politely decline. But God is just showing me that picture, that analogy, and saying that some of you feel like God is that stranger that's trying to trick you, that he's trying to harm you, that when he says something to you, he doesn't really mean it, or it's not really pure, or he has bad intentions. But I believe that God, I know that God is a good father and he's not trying to harm you. He's not trying to make you feel bad. He's not trying to bring danger to you. So you are safe to say yes to him. You are safe to say yes to him. Maybe you've had people in your life promise you stuff and it doesn't come to pass. You've had people say countless things to you and it always falls through. So you're scared to trust, you're scared to really yield and give yourself over to him completely. But God is saying, I'm not that strange man with a sweet that wants to harm you. I'm your heavenly father and when I give a good gift, I mean it. When I give a word, I mean it. We have to stop settling for lesser things to measure our lives by. Mary says, according to your word. So many of us have settled for things according to what I think of myself, it will happen. According to what people expect of me, it will happen. According to what it looks like right now, it will happen. But I really believe that God is asking for some of you in here, no matter how crazy it looks, to just say, according to your word. That God, if you've spoken it, if you've said it, I'm going to believe it wholeheartedly and nothing will shake me. Even if all hell breaks loose over the purpose that you've given me, I'm still going to say, let it be unto me according to your word. Not let it be unto me according to my current abilities. Not let it be unto me according to what my parents have said that I can do. But let it be on to me according to your word. That's the posture. Job 42 verse 2, he says, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Some of you need to meditate on that verse in this season. That even if everything around you, everything concerning what God has said that you will do for him is looking absolutely horrible and nothing is going to plan you can say no purpose of yours can be thwarted no word that you have spoken will return to you void no promise that you have declared will go unfulfilled in my life you have to start believing those things you can't expect everybody else to believe it for you that belief has to rise up on the inside of your own spirit man your own inner man even today, I'll be so honest with you, I'll be transparent. Before coming to preach yesterday, I was going back and forth in my mind, like, Lord, can I really do this? Like, I was getting into what type of preacher I should be and what type of style I should do. And you spiral yourself into so many thoughts and you get to the place where you just don't want to do anything anymore. But in that moment, God picked me up by the grace of God. And he says, don't concern yourself with the details. Don't concern yourself with trying to be what everybody else wants you to be or trying to appease to every single camp. Just flow. Just go for it. God is saying to someone in here, just go for it. Because his word has said it, you can go and walk in confidence. When you're posturing yourself for his purpose, his word has to be what matters most to you. When nothing else makes sense, the treasure of his word, the word that he spoke to you, hold to that. Believe according to that. Set your expectations according to that. And as I conclude, I just want to say this, that what Mary was carrying was something that people didn't expect. They were expecting on it in the sense that they knew that a coming Messiah was coming, but they didn't expect it to come from where it was coming. 
In earlier verses, you'll see that in the book of John, Philip finds Nathaniel and says to him, we found the one Moses wrote about in the law, the one the prophets foretold, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathaniel asks, can anything good come from Nazareth? And Philip says, come and see. God was not oblivious to the fact that the little teenage girl he was picking to carry the Messiah was from Nazareth. That she was there in Galilee, a place of bad reputation. A place where people said nothing good can come out of that place. A lot of them were uneducated. They weren't wealthy. But not only did something good come out of there, the definition of good came out of there. The goodness of God personified in the flesh came out of there. Mary, that little girl from Nazareth where they said nothing good can come out of there, carried the goodness of God. She carried God himself. And that was birthed out of her. And this is the Jesus that I want to remind you died for your sin. He took on all the wrongdoing, everything that you had ever done that has displeased God, that has fallen short of the standard that God writes in his word. She was carrying that, that Jesus, that Jesus who rose from the dead so that you could have victory in your life so that you didn't have to stay in bondage to sin, so that you could have power over sin and you could have an abundant life in him. So I want to ask you to stand with me. And I want to just open up the altar for those who maybe have never heard of Jesus or have never really opened up their heart to receive him as Lord.